Well, happy Pride weekend. Most everybody is out and enjoying the Pride, even amidst the rain, and going enjoying the wonderful uh, atmosphere of coming together. Last night, driving home, I saw the city lit up in rainbow colors, and I was ever impressed with the number of buildings that had uh, illuminated their structures in rainbow colors. If you saw Midtown lit up in rainbow colors, BB&T uh, building, rainbow colors, you saw uh, the uh, several structures, the one with that looks like praying hands. I forgot all the names of these different buildings, all lit up in rainbow colors. What an exciting thing to see as the city comes together to celebrate inclusion. Something that you may not have seen 50 years ago, certainly not uh, 30 years ago. You wondered if we would ever see it in this day and how beautiful it is to see Atlanta celebrating this. This is the city's largest festival. Largest festival of any type whatsoever. Largest parade in the state of Georgia happening today. All this coming together to celebrate the spirit of unity, inclusion, oneness. Something that we firmly believe in here at City of Light. Something we preach and practice is that we celebrate, that we come together and celebrate our diversity. We celebrate the uniqueness of who we are, whether we are black or white, gay or straight, transgender or are questioning and wondering whether we are tall or short, whether we are large or small. It matters not who we are, but we celebrate that in oneness. So today is one of those great moments where we can know that the city is wakening up to the wonderful spirit of saying, everyone is included. So with that, let's take a deep breath as we go into this wonderful time of looking to scripture and allowing it to unfold for us. Breathe in together and release. Wonderful. One of the great questions that the Bible asks over and over in so many different ways is something that stands out and jumps out before us in today's text. It also unfolds for us in stories that are echoed down, repeated over and over again because the Bible is famous for repetition. It's trying to get certain themes across, certain messages across. So there's a very important question that the scripture is asking and inviting us to really challenge and ask ourselves. And that question is, have you been to the pool lately? Yeah, I'm talking about that wonderful pool. Yeah, laying by the pool, enjoying the sunshine, laying by the pool, lounging and the cool waters, basking in the sun, you know, resting in the shade or maybe a pool. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Let's go to our scripture text and let's really unfold a little bit more from the lesson for us today. It's not your vacation pool. It's not your hotel pool. It's not your clubhouse pool. They're asking the question, have you been to the pool lately? It's the pool of Bethesda. In Jerusalem, there was a wonderful pool in ancient times that was there for those who were lame or those who were sickly. It was sort of the house of mercy described. And so it was this place where people would go and rest and they would rest poolside and hopefully was the legend went when an angel came and stirred the waters the first one into the pool hey everybody jump in the pool come on quick 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 would be healed unfortunately so many sat poolside waiting for that to occur and if they heard the water stirred just slightly oh how wonderful well someone help me someone help me oh but someone would get to the pool before them and somewhat they would feel oh let's just be resigned to stay in this feeling of our sickness, of our state, of where we are, and who we are. Lame, unable, sickly. Let's just remain there. For it seems so hopeless for so many who had sat. And in particular, the beautiful story from John chapter 5 shares with us that there was a man, lame man who had sat there for 38 years of his life. We don't know his age, whether he began that at age 10 or sitting there at age 15 or 20. But 38 years, he sat by the pool in great hopes and aspirations that one day he might receive some sort of healing, looking from some source without him to come and help him, to assist him. He sat there with this feeling of hopelessness year after year. Now, the Bible is full of so many messages and nuances. Last night, I was hosting some guests in my house, some people who were uh, inquiring about my work as a pastor and said, how can you come up with something to preach about every Sunday? 
It seems so strange. You've been pastoring for 42 years and you keep up something to talk about. Oh, I said the scripture is full of all kinds of things to talk about. And the beautiful thing is every time you read a story, a familiar story, there's some nuance, something new that pops up, a new message that's revealed for us, something that comes to speak to our hearts and lives in a fresh new way. For the scripture is the living text and it comes alive for us. It's the living word for us. It is living in the sense that as we look at it, it speaks fresh and new to us. And intentionally so, the writers wrote with such great symbolism that they might evoke word pictures for you, that might help you take on a journey of visualization, that might help you see yourself even more so in the actual story and the text. For it's the story behind the story that we continually look to. People want to argue over all kinds of things. Was there really a pool of Bethesda? Was there really this place in Jerusalem? Was there really a sheep's gate as is described in the text? What is all of these kind of things? Are they really there? It doesn't really matter because we're not about the physical aspects. We're about the story behind the story. We're about the application for our lives. We're about the truth that's written and embedded and mined and pulled out for us to live by. That's what we hold dear. So let's look at this story. For it's a story of Jesus' healing, not one just to exonerate Jesus. Because what would that mean for us today if we said, well, Jesus healed a lame man. That's wonderful. How many of you healed a lame man today? Well, then how does this have power and meaning for us in this moment? Because, see, there's a lot of Bible stories. If we look at them, it's history. We look at them in the context of seeing, reading them, that, oh, this is a great, lovely story about Jesus. Suddenly it has very little impact to our own lives. But suddenly when we say, wait a minute, what's today's story that is my story that is me? Oh, then suddenly it speaks to us. For again and again, we want to reiterate that the Bible is so exciting. It is the psychology of the soul. It is the science of the mind and heart. It is the unfolding of this wonderful study of who we are and how we live and with great insight and invitation for us to achieve our highest and best. So let's look at some of these beautiful nuances in the story. First of all, the story takes place in Jerusalem. And we might look at that word alone and see that its setting is conveying a message to us. For Jerusalem is known as the city or center of peace, a place of peaceful consciousness. So already, let's just put ourselves in a place of peaceful consciousness. We're aware of perfect peace. We're aware of this wonderful peace that's available to us at all times. For Jerusalem symbolizes this spiritual center. And as we go there, we get this deep sense of uh, the silence. And we get a sense that in this stillness that we realize this wonderful passage coming alive. Be still and know that I am God. Let's go to our own individual Jerusalem. Let's go to our peaceful center. Let's go to our spiritual center within. And that begins the unfolding of this text. For at that place... At that centered place, that spiritual place where all things unfold for us, something was found. It was a special day. There was a feast in Jerusalem. And so when we look at the word feast, we find it also symbolizes for us this open, receptive mind. Okay, Jerusalem is a peaceful state of mind. And a feast is, oh, we're receiving all kinds of bounty of good stuff. And I have a receptive mind. It's like a wonderful reception for all the good, the truth that's available to us. So suddenly we find the story saying for us, unfolding these wonderful nuances that, ah, there was a moment of spiritual centering and a receptive mind willing to receive and open towards all the spiritual good. Well, that tells you right there, we could stop and all go home right there. Because just alone, reading that first lines, few lines of John chapter 5 unfolding in the story, just telling us, yes, every moment of our life when we're in our spiritual center and we're open towards the, all the spiritual good, amazing things happen. Amazing things unfold for us. So we find there that there was a gate called the Sheep Gate just outside this pool of Bethesda. The sheep gate and the word sheep, we look all through scriptures. How many of you heard the scriptures preached to you? All we like sheep have gone astray. Maybe you've heard that over and over again. That we're likened unto sheep and people want to say, wait a minute, I don't like that analogy. 
But really what we look at sheep are this harmless and innocent animals, and they represent our natural life, our true state. So the symbolism of the writer is saying, you in your true state, in your natural state of life, that is your divine or divinity, your divine understanding is your natural state. This is your physical state. Your true state is your spiritual life, who you are in spirit. That's your true state. So the gate or the entrance, the opening place, was that of this wonderful innocence of opening towards our true spiritual state or awakening of that true spiritual state. So it's called the sheepscape. All these small nuances are so beautiful because they begin to make the story have even more richness to it as it unfolds. Because how important it is for that gate to be open, the gate of our life, of our heart, our spirit to always be open, that we're open to our true self. You know, there's authentic, real self. In today's world, especially on Pride Sunday, there's a lot of people out there celebrating their authentic self transgender community saying, this is who I am in my authentic self. LGBT, uh, Q, I, B, Z, elemental P, on we go the list of all our wonderful friends and family in this great community celebrating, this is my authentic self. This is who I really am. And how wonderful it is that when we also look into our spiritual life and that we as a community of God say, this is my authentic self. I am a child of God. And the gate, the sheep gate, is open in Jerusalem, in my spiritual center. It's open wide for me to have this wonderful understanding of my authentic spiritual self as the child of God. Along with that, this pool was located in an area with five different porches. Interesting that the writer describes it this way and and it'll brings in the five senses, symbolic of the wonderful hearing, taste, seeing, smell, and touch of all the appearances of the physical world. And many people rested in the porches, the lame, sick, ill, resting in the porches of the five senses. And you and I, we find ourselves at the pool, uh uh-huh, not putting on sun tan oil, but quite often resting in the porches of the five senses, where we are all looking to every single day, what do I smell? What do I taste? What do I see? What do I hear? Uh, you know, what do I touch? And we live in this kind of realm, resting in the five porches, resting in our five senses, and we're constantly looking at life that way. We wonder why we're always held back, maybe feeling a little sick, not feeling our highest and best, maybe feeling a little ill in spirit as well in physical body because we're always looking to the appearances and trusting on, well, I don't smell anything good today. I don't taste anything good today. I don't feel anything good today. I don't touch anything good today. I certainly don't see anything good today. It's not a good day. And from that perspective, we never move on in a healing experience in our lives because we're locked in sitting in one of the five porches or the five senses that are holding our lives. They are this physical world. And so it is that this story is our story of how many times have we come into this Jerusalem, this spiritual center, and the gate's wide open, and we're ready to receive in our authentic self, we're ready to experience our highest and best, uh, but we're sitting in the porch by the pool, and we're locked into I don't see nothing good. I don't hear anything good. Certainly don't taste anything good. And so we're locked into all the physical experiences or appearances around us. That is where, you know, what's happening is uh, people sitting there, they're struggling with their faith. And faith is one of these things to say, you know, how can I believe when I can't see, when I can't touch, when I can't taste, when I can't hear? How do I believe anything at all? Because, well, let me tell you this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, not tasted, not touched, not heard. You see, that's the essence of true faith in within our lives. Let me tell you this. Everybody's experiencing faith every single day. A lot of people say, wait a minute, pastor, how do I get more faith then? I want some faith in my life. 
Can I get a diploma on faith? Can I learn faith? Can, is there a class on faith? How do I? I'm going to tell you, you have faith. You exercise faith every single day in your life. You live by faith. You may not always acknowledge it. The problem is, quite often is, what we're demonstrating is that we're having faith in the wrong things. We're putting a lot of faith into fear. We're putting a lot of faith into worry. We're putting a lot of faith into our insecurities. We put a lot of energy into those kind of things. And here's the really big one that stands out that I see a lot in my 42 years of pastoral ministry is the great faith in I can't. Oh, I'm such a believer in I can't, they would say. Oh, I've got such strong faith in I can't. I have the assurance. I have the confidence. I have the knowing. I have all these wonderful aspects of faith in the I can't. Boy, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone told me I can't. I'd be a billionaire and I'd be certainly sitting by the pool in Tahiti. <laughs> uh, I'd be a millionaire for all those people who said I can't, I can't, I can't. I can't do this, Pastor. I can't do that. I can't, oh no, I, I can't go, I can't go here, I can't do there. Oh, on and on, and in their spiritual life. I can't have faith. I can't believe. I can't give. I can't trust. I can't, all these kind of things, and so amazing how much faith people exercise, but they exercise it in the wrong thing. So consequently, what happens is we find people who are practicing the absence of God, not practicing the presence of God. There's a big difference. And sometimes in our Christian world, we go around and all we're doing is practicing the absence of God, rather than the true presence here, now, in this moment, right with us, dwelling in us, flowing through us, flowing all around us and always for us, that we understand that the, we practice the presence and not practice the absence of the presence. Now, the pool, this pool is really uh, the realization of our life being constantly uh, purified and healed by the stirring of the mind. Okay. Remember the pool of water? What was the tradition? If the angel came and stirred the waters. What's the writer trying to tell us in deeper meaning for us? Well, the angel is a message from God. If a message of God came and stirred the waters, and what are waters? Waters of our consciousness. Waters of our thought. How many times have we seen this illustrated in Scripture over and over again? Peter walking above the waters of the worldly thought of consciousness and chaos. Right? And we can rise too to walk above the waters of chaotic thought. How about the Red Sea parting and the waters part and create a pathway? Uh, the Lord is making a way when there seems to be no way. And the waters are parting for us of this thought and that thought, opening up and waking a passageway. Yet when we've seen water in front of us as a big obstacle, thoughts that say, I can't, I can't, it's not possible, there's no way, this ain't going to work. And suddenly it parts and makes a pathway for us. So we find this beautiful illustration that this pool of water being stirred then by the wonderful message of God, by stirring in our minds, is the simple story for us. And when we awaken to the fact, is my pool being stirred today? The waters of my thought, my consciousness, am I allowing a message from God to stir the waters? Because when the waters are stirred, Healing begins. You see the beautiful metaphor there in the lesson? People waiting, waiting and waiting, but they're waiting for, are you going to stir the water? Are you going to stir the water? What's going to stir the water? And we're oblivious to the stirring of water. We're oblivious to the new thoughts, to the stirring of our consciousness, to the awakening of our mind, to the awakening of the enrichment that's available to us and the enlightenment that's available to us. We are waiting and oblivious to it. And so what happens is that we're waiting for the moving of the water. Waiting, waiting. Some of us, 38 years like a lame man. Some people waiting 10 years. Some people waiting a whole lifetime. Some people transitioning and moving on, still waiting for the moving of the waters. A stirring within their thoughts, in their awakening, in their consciousness. A stirring that says, Oh, oh, I get it. A new thought, a new awakening, a new understanding is available to me each and every day. 
If you don't like your life, you change your thought. If you don't like your pathway that you're going, you make a change. You think a new thought. You think a new way. You experience this born-again experience in your life. Jesus offers it to us. If you don't like your life, it's the life you've created in your thoughts. So stir the consciousness and allow the message of God to awaken you to a new thought, a new way of thinking, a new hope, a new passion, a new desire within you that my life might be so different that it might be awakened to the highest and best of what's possible for me. That's what I desire. I'm no longer waiting for the moving of the water. I'm doing the water stirring myself. That's what we need to be. Stir the water of the thought. Allow God's message, message from the divine to come to us and say, ah, I am awakening my thoughts to realize that the highest and best is available to me. I'm tired of thinking I can't. How about that? How about you? Aren't you tired of it? Aren't you tired of the world saying you can't? Aren't you tired of living in a world and environment that's always going to be negative and always trying to be destructive to the joy, the peace, the compassion, the love, the forgiveness that you embody within your life? Aren't you tired of it? Well, let's make a change. Let's stir the waters of our hearts and our minds. Let's awaken our consciousness to this wonderful understanding that there is something amazing out there for us. Well, the challenge is the lame man then embodies you and I practicing the absence of God. That's right. The question is, have you been to the pool lately where you have been practicing the absence, not the presence? Because I find so many people believe in a God out there versus a God within, the divine within, the presence within in you, created in that likeness and image. I hear people constantly saying, you know, oh, would you pray to the big man in the sky? Would you reach out to someone, that God in the heavens? Would you call and beseech, Pastor, for me? Would you pray before me for God for somehow to do something? Can you manipulate God? Can you massage God? Can you kind of get God to agree with you? A lot of requests that they make of a pastor in his prayer life. But we find 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know? And that's the problem. People sitting there by the pool just don't know. Don't know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells out in the universe somewhere boy over from. No, dwells in you. That's what it says, that the Spirit of God dwells in you, in you and in you and in you and in you. And so here's the problem. We have been thinking God is outside of us. God is somewhere up in the heavens. God is somewhere out in the universe. God is this being outside of our lives, and we then are practicing the absence of God. That's our problem. Do you not know that you are the temple? And that's the whole challenge for those laying by the poolside, suffering in their conditions, embodying their lame, ill, their disease, their physical uh, positions in life, all of it embodies those who just embraced and taken in, in victimhood and celebrated, woe is me, this is just who I am. I hear that a lot. Pastor, this is just who I am. I am only human. Isn't it funny when we come to that perspective where we believe we're only human and that's all we think we are? We don't think ourselves as anything other than just human. And yet you are this divine creation. Do you not know, the scripture says, you are the temple of the Lord, the dwelling place, and the spirit of God is dwelling within you. Oh, but you're saying, I'm just human. Oh, yes, you are human. But you're also this divine, divine, divine creation, full of the spirit and presence of the all good, full of the spirit and presence of that wonderful God of blessing and infinite possibilities. You cannot say I'm only human and practice the presence of God. For practicing the presence of God is an awareness. I am human, but I also am the temple of the Lord. I am the dwelling place. Uh, the spirit of God is within me, through me, around me, and for me. You have to proclaim that if you're practicing the presence. Those who were sitting by the pool then were those gathering, and I imagine in circles, 
who are always saying we're only human and offering those excuses. Because when Jesus came to the lame man and offered him the a powerful question of saying, do you want to be healed? Hmm. He didn't say, hey, by the way, I can take care of that for you. Uh, how about I heal you right now? Uh, how, you know, but the question was, do you want it? Do you want it? So this story is our story. We're down through the ages. It's asking us, what do you want? Do you want this? Do you want your prosperity? Do you want your blessing? Do you want your success? Do you want to achieve your highest and best? Do you want it? Do you really want it? Well, that has to be there. That has to be a moment where we can say with great assurance and great positivity and confidence, I want it. Say it with me. I want it. I want it. That's right. I want the highest and best within my life. I am tired of laying by the pool and practicing the absence of God. I want it. And today I practice the presence. God in me, God through me. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, Scripture says. Wait a minute, all things? Then how come you're saying I can't? Uh huh. How can you say it's not possible when the Scripture says I can do all things? All things means all things, everything. Then how is we as the temple of the Lord, how on earth can we say I'm only human and I can't? It doesn't jive with the very message of who we are and our life's journey. The scripture is telling you you're full of infinite possibilities, but you've been laying by the pool a little too long. You've been laying by the pool in all of your sorrows and sadness and your victimhood. You've been practicing the absence of God, and what has happened for you is then you have moved away from the true awareness, and the sheep gate is closed. So here's Jesus who is symbolic of the great I am. Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? Well, we know that Jesus proclaimed, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the life, the truth, and the way. I am this. Oh, he went on with the I am, embodying for us the very essence of an I am presence. Everywhere he's going, he's saying, I am. He's proclaiming the I am, the divinity within. And if we're going to be like Jesus, and that's our desire, and I think we want to be like Jesus, who is the great example for our lives, then we too have to be the I am in our scenario. Do you want to be healed? Well, the I am is here. The I am is here to answer your questions, to, to meet your needs. The I am is here. It's within you that I am is the divine presence of God. We know that. What did Moses say when he encountered the burning bush? Who do I say that sent me? And the burning bush says, the I am. The I am within you. Oh, there's that beautiful text from, I believe it's the book of Isaiah that says, and now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. It is the proclamation of the I am in this moment. If you want to be healed, lame person, if you want to be healed, person of sickness, if you want to be healed, person who says, I can't, if you want to be healed of any of this, it's the awakening to the, oh, I am. I am the dwelling place of the divine. The power of God dwells in me. I am not absent from the presence. I am in the presence. And I dwell in the presence. I stand in the presence. I walk in the presence. I sing in the presence. I move in the presence. I dance in the presence. I am in the presence. The presence is who I am. I am this. And in that proclamation, you see, he, Jesus offers him and said, if you, I am, being the I am, says, do you want to be healed? Then pick up your bed and walk. How simple it is for us in the journey of our life. What is it we want in our life? Well, the presence of God's already in you, waiting, waiting, waiting for you. Would you just stir the pool a little bit and stir up your consciousness a little bit, stir up your awakening? Because it's waiting to perform the healing, the unfolding of your highest and best, waiting for your good, waiting for your blessing to come and happen within you waiting for all this and been waiting, waiting, and waiting for you just to be able to say in one moment, I am the divine. 
I am the presence. I am not absent, but living in and through it. And suddenly then you have the ability to say, I am, and I've just picked up my bed and walked. I am, and I'm walking in my prosperity. I am, I'm walking in my blessing. I am, and I can. I am, and all things are working together for good for me. Because I am in the presence. So when we look at this, the big question today that Scripture wants to ask us is, have you been to the pool lately? Yeah. Have you been sitting by the pool? Sitting under those five porches of the five senses? Well, I don't feel it. I don't see it. I don't touch it. I don't taste it. And all I can see is my victimhood. All I can see is my challenge. All I can see is my problems. All I can see is my sickness, my disease, my illness, whatever it may be that you're saying. All I can do is exude the faith of worry, faith in stress, and faith in I can. Have you been sitting at the pool waiting for someone else to stir the waters? Well, honey, today I'm here to stir your water. Uh huh. I'm here to mix it up a little for you. I'm here to tell you that this is your day to jump in the waters, the waters of new thought thinking, the waters of consciousness of awakening, the waters that say to you and speak to you, you are the divine presence. Do you not know you are the temple of the Lord? Well, if you don't know it by now, I'm telling you, honey, you're the temple. Turn to someone and say, you're the temple. Come on, you're the temple, you're the temple, you're the temple. And what happens in the temple? The Spirit of God dwells in you. What is that spirit? It's the same spirit that was in David to defeat Goliath. The same spirit that was in Daniel in the lion's den. The same spirit that was Moses that led through the, them through the children uh, through the wilderness. The children of Israel through the wilderness. That same spirit that caused the walls to fall down in Jericho and uh, liberate the people. That same spirit is there in you right here, right now. And your choice is, do I sit at the pool? Or am I going to pick up my bed and start practicing the presence of God? What am I going to do? The absence of God or the presence of God? God outside me? God somewhere? Where, where are you, God? I don't know. In the heavens? God, who you're beseeching, beating your chest and hoping to call attention to? Or the God that's within you, waiting for you to simply acknowledge and say, I am. Amen.